Way Back and Trade, a podcast by Trade in the Market. Welcome to episode five of Way Back and Trade. In this episode, we are joined by Matt and Lisa, who will be interviewing Mark and Erin. And our special guest is James Bloody Boom. Hello, James, and welcome to the podcast. How are we doing, Mark? Not been on one I'm of good these. yourself? Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, I'm good. Not been on one of these for a little while. Yeah, this is the bit where we pretend we've not spoken for four hours yesterday, six hours the day before. <laughs> And we haven't we haven't spoken to each other in weeks, and like we're having a little catch up. But in actual reality, I think we've been chatting now for about an hour and a half. Yeah, <laughs> it's a bit of a sombre start to the podcast, I think, with the the passing of uh, Sir Bobby Charlton, um, which I thought we we needed to record a sort of separate intro to the podcast just for that reason, um, just to pay our respects. Yeah, hundred um... percent. Really sad news, yeah, I couldn't believe it yesterday. I only realised he'd passed away from um, reading the comments of our Discord. Um, I was busy all day yesterday and it kept flashing up on my phone, so, yeah, really sad news. It's amazing how we get the we get some of our news from the Discord now, isn't it? it uh, there's so, the people in there are so fingers on the pulse. Well, yeah, there's that much going on. I think this is quite possibly the best combination to be talking about it, because Bobby Charlton, not only as a Man United player, but a Preston manager and player manager as well. And you being a Man United fan and me being a Preston fan, it's a bit serendipitous. Yeah, totally agree. Like I say, um, last night I was uh, reading through a few things about him and uh, I didn't actually know he managed uh, Preston. I knew he'd played for you, but I didn't know he'd managed you as well. He was the manager in 1973. So he came over as manager in 1973 and brought over former England teammate uh, Nobby Styles with him really? as uh, a player coach. And then uh, Bob, uh, Sir, Sir Bobby Charlton then switched into the role as player manager in uh, the following season. Wow! Did he still have his call over then? Uh, he did, yeah. And uh, <laughs> he only put in, I think he only put eight goals in for us, but then he got us relegated. So uh, we, we departed ways with. He got um, you relegated. He, 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 well, he fell out with the board over selling a player to Newcastle. I can't remember who it was, but yeah. Wow! And that was all in the space. Was that over two years? Did you say? Yeah, so 1973 he came to us and he, he departed in 1975. Wow. Yeah. Well, never knew that. You learn yeah. something new every day. Well, the only other fact I've got about him, to be fair, uh, James, is he he's never been sent off in his career and he only ever picked up two bookings, so two yellow cards. Sounds like Gary Lineker, although I think he was zero, wasn't he? He never got booked. I think he was zero, to be fair. So, well, Sir Bobby Charlton, I've made a note of the uh, of the two yellow cards as well. So one of them was in the infamous World Cup quarterfinal against Argentina in 1966. Yeah. The other was in a league match against Chelsea. I thought you were going to say Liverpool, but yeah, fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Chelsea. Or potentially Manchester City, but I don't even think they were around back then. <laughs> I don't think they're around now, are they? Well, yeah, they are now, yeah. All the money brought them back. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely nothing. Not um, bitter at all. No, it's, not my fight. it's not my fight to have. You've been looking at Sir Bobby Charlton's playing career, haven't you? I did last night, yeah. That, obviously, he's a legend for Man United. I have seen many a rerun and clip. Watched a couple of full matches, actually, um, of the old stuff. And, yeah, Christ almighty, what a set of legs he had on him. Jesus, I mean... They were playing with them old style footballs, the uh, not these flyaway things they've got these days, like the old style rock air ones. And Christ, they were powering them in from like thirty yards out. Absolute machine, really, absolute machine. But yeah, obviously I'm a Man United fan, and yeah, he scored. Uh, I think you read this. What was it? Two hundred and forty nine goals in seven hundred and fifty eight appearances, and obviously that was the club record until uh, Wayne, Wayne Rooney broke it only by four goals. Or he two hundred and fifty three. Did uh, was a score. Light a ball, though, weren't it? Easy to score. Oh, yeah, it just flies away. Just tap it in, boom, it's in top corner. I'm sure that, like things like boots and shin pads have become a lot lighter since back then as well. <laughs> oh, yeah, they don't even have proper studs anymore. They have, um, what do they call them, moldies? M- moulds, yeah. Moulds, moldies, moulders. No, moulders, that's the Yeah, moulds. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I know we've both got a story about Bobby Charlton. Were you at a game, were you saying? Yeah, yeah, back when I used to still have my uh, Manchester United season ticket. Do you know what? I can't even remember who the game was against. Um, it was a home game. It was about six, seven years ago, I think. And 
pretty sure, oh, I'm going to get this wrong now, it's either Van Hal or Mourinho. Um, but yeah, the um, unveiled the Sir Bobby Charlton stand um, for him, and obviously did put um, cardboard cutouts of red and white. Obviously, everybody had to hold them up, and it said Sir Bobby on it, and we all had flags, and yeah, amazing. I've still got videos of that on my phone, actually. It was amazing. The atmosphere there must have been immense. Oh, it was absolutely electric, mate. Electric. I've been to some games and you could hear a pin drop and that one. Fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. Sad times. Can't believe he's gone. But yeah, go on. What was yours? What was your story? I had the absolute privilege to meet him, but I, I almost didn't know I met him. So I was going away on holiday shot. with my other half and we're off to the Dominican and we booked into the VIP lounge at Manchester Airport and... Um, we thought nothing of it. It was like weeks out that we booked through like a, a travel agent. And it was September 2004. And as we got to the VIP lounge, we were told um, that while we were in there, you weren't allowed to take any photos. And we're like, right, okay. Well, so be it, whatever. I'm not sure why or what, what the purpose of that was. And we got in and there was there was us and there was another couple um, sat on like the far side of the lounge. And we thought, oh, it'd be quiet in here. We thought there'd be more people in. And then about about 10, 15 minutes later, people started piling in. Yeah, there were these big round tables that uh, you sat and ate your breakfast and drank coffee out. It was a morning flight. As we were sat there, Paul Paul sort of nudged me. And he's like, Mark, do you know who sat around? I was like, no, not a clue. I'm just like minding my own business. And it was the Man United squad. So they were flying out to Lyon for a game for the UEFA uh, Champions, uh, League. Champions League, was it? Yeah, yeah. Would it have been back, that back then? What year were it? I can't remember what you said. Then. 2004. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it would have been European Cup, Champions League, yes. Yeah, and it was it was definitely a group stage. And they were flying out to, uh, like I say, they were flying out to play Leon. And, yeah, we were literally surrounded by Man United players. Uh, I went up to go and refill a coffee. And the guy who took the coffee pot out of my hand was Bobby Charlton, um, who <laughs> was trying to fill up his. <laughs> well, <Wow. laughs> and uh, it was only once I sat back down and Paul's like that. Do you know who that? Do you know who that old bloke is? I'm like, no, I'm not a clue. He's like it's Bobby Charlton. It's <laughs> crazy. So is that was that the whole squad? I had a, I had a running with gigs. He shoulder barged me. No, I don't <laughs> think he did it on purpose, but he's just a bit arrogant. I think he did. I'm going to get that in because I, I, I. Well, he probably did do it on purpose. I, I'm, I've never been a fan of him since. Um, <laughs> but we were trying to see the de- flight departures, and he, he's pushed in front and ended up knocking me. Um, but yeah, there was. So was it uh, just them two, or were they all there? Was it the whole squad? No, they were all there. So uh, the whole squad there. Me. So um, it was Al- Alex Ferguson would have been at the time. Yeah. Um, there was Keane, Van Nistelrooy, uh, Ronaldo, O'Shea, Legend, <laughs> Tim Howard, Paul Scholes was there. So Paul Scholes was on our table. So yeah, it was. Uh, I got to meet him. I did speak to him, but like uh, only about coffee. And I didn't know it was him. And if if Paul hadn't recognised him uh, or recognised the fact that it was the United Squad, I, I'm I, I'm typical like this where yeah, there could be a famous person stood next to me and I won't have a clue. Somebody has to tell me that they're famous. Remember that time we saw Jason Manford? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, in Manchester having breakfast. Yeah, having breakfast and like on the table next to us. Yeah, yeah. And if it wasn't for Dave going, that's Jason Manford. <laughs> I would never know. <laughs> I don't. I, I honestly don't think any of them ever looked like themselves. Yeah, he did look different to be fair, but it was like nine o'clock in the morning. He probably just woke up, so he's not been and got all his uh, wardrobe on and makeup and all that, make himself look and beautiful. We had the been cameras. drinking heavily the night before. Well, yeah, we had. Yeah, yeah. but you're not really paying attention to the room, are you? Well, you don't really expect to be sat there eating your uh, induce your eggs and uh, look up and there's uh, Mister Manfred. Are you on sponsorship for the cafe or something? <laughs> I haven't even mentioned which cafe it is. <laughs> <laughs> no, we had to get what you had in. Uh, oh, the, the Judah eggs. And, and oh, you've changed. Eggs. You've changed. Phenomenal. And then you uh, take the lad out of Bolton, though. Oh yeah, <laughs> <laughs> amazing place. Amazing that's, the same, place. that's the same place you got that coffee thing from, wasn't it? Oh, the uh, Afogato. Oh. <laughs> um, I'm only mentioning it because we do have a special listener called Jimmy who will be annoyed <laughs> by that. <laughs> yeah, he seems to think I was annoyed by it, but it literally came with a... So for anybody that doesn't know, I forget, so it's um, a dollop of, well, I presume it was vanilla ice cream with a shot of espresso over the top. 
So I'd never had one before, was slightly hungover and thought, do you know what, let's have a try. Um, paid, I think it was £4.70 for it or something like that, which I believe was extortionate. I thought it was all right. Um, I, th- I thought it was fine, yeah. <laughs> when they brought it to me, they had um, a mint leaf on it. So obviously me being me, the lad from Bolton was like, mint leaf. <laughs> so I took the mint leaf off, sat there, casually drinking my uh, affogato. Proper enjoyed that, we're good. And for some reason, Jimmy seems to think <laughs> I was disgusted. I don't know where he gets his, uh, these ideas from, but yeah, ah, amazing. When I go back there, I'll get it again. Yeah, to be fair, Jimmy was livid with that drink, uh, and I don't know why, but the prices of stuff in London are astronomical, so £4.80, I thought, was, would have been quite reasonable. <laughs> Down there, that would get you, what, the, a newspaper? Quite possibly. <laughs> <laughs> let's, let's, let's talk about that. Like I say, I, I, I've, I always struggle to uh, recognise... Any celebrities or footballers, but um, that, that's just me. Uh, you ever? It would have been a dream for you to be there. I take it. But have you ever? Uh, you ever met any of the Man United squad? Or um, I have. Yeah, I've met individual players over the last couple of years. But that, obviously, for me, growing up, um, all my family were United fans, and um, my dad especially. And he used to take me and my sister into Salford, and we used to go to the training ground. Not Carrington where they train now, it was the cliff. And yeah, literally, if you was within the first hundred people there in the morning at the gate, they would literally let you in, stand in the car park and wait for the players to come and pull up in the cars. Um, so yeah, every Saturday we used to, we were there, we were near enough first um, and we were always in. And literally we'd wait there and have me United magazines and anybody that came, I'd get up signed their, uh, the picture and whatnot and obviously... Eric Cantona was uh, of that era and he was my hero and I was Cantona mad and Cantona posters, Cantona cups, you name it and every time he came I got him to sign everything and if not before long he'd turn up and say, morning James. <laughs> but he, he literally did. He actually, called, he actually called, he knew your name? He knew my name had been that many times and it was the same uh, with my sister, I won't mention her name but obviously she was besotted with the uh, rain gigs. So he was the same. He once sent her uh, a birthday card. I, I, I don't know if you remember. I, I don't actually like Ryan Giggs. I, I know you don't like Ryan Giggs. And I, know he's a I, I disliked him before everybody else started disliking him. Though. That's true. Yeah. I don't know what the hell he's done with himself lately, but yeah, he's literally ruined his name a little bit. Um, but yeah, what a player. He was class. Absolutely he used to live, he lived down the road from where I live now. Yeah, he did. In between us. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm pretty sure, I think he took that house as well, Peter Kerr, at one stage. I think he did, you know. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure. You said Eric Cantona was your idol. Yeah, yeah. If, if I remember, didn't you used to have a poster of him on your wall? Uh, more than one, yeah. Yeah, and you used to kiss it before you go to bed. I did. <laughs> yeah. Good night, Eric. Was that, <laughs> was that not for the podcast? <laughs> oh, God. Literally every night I'd get up, stand up on top of my bed, give Eric a big kiss and uh, say, Je t'aime, Eric. <laughs> 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 I didn't, I'm joking. Maybe once I did that, but I probably had a few babies at 40. Yeah, as long as, long as you're kissing him on the face, I, I, I don't think we have a problem. <laughs> Well, yeah, he were, he were class. I had all his shirts. I've, got, I've still got them, to be fair, all the old United shirts with Canton S7. And then, obviously, when he retired, I moved on to uh, Ollie Gunner, Ollie Gunner Solskjaer, the baby faced assassin. But, yeah, no, it was good, it was good back then. Like I say, we used to stand in care park, going back to the cliff. That's what I was originally talking about. Obviously, Canton and all them lot come in, Yuzi, Paul Inch, Robson, like the amazing Peter Schmeichel, we'd see Ferguson. I've got many a picture with Ferguson. I think I've got his autograph about 40 times. Um, but yeah, it's, it was great. Then with the days, and now they don't even let you anywhere near Carrington. You can't get in. Absolutely. It's crazy. It's the same pretty much all over, though, isn't it? It's, we, I don't live, as you know, a million miles away from the Preston training ground, and it's, you can't even get close to it. Yeah, yeah. It, it is mad. You'd think this day and age they'd let people in, wouldn't you? But. I remember as a kid how the uh, Preston players used to train by jogging through the streets of Preston. That's what I mean. You don't get that anymore, do you? Unless you no. just get mugged. No, they get mugged. <laughs> well, well, I don't think they'll get mugged. They'll be in the tracks. <laughs> 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 oh, yeah, they'll be they running around really with uh, 20 kids, 20k in the pocket. <laughs> just took your money down the street. <laughs> 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 um, yeah, I suppose. <laughs> 
Will the pair of you just shut up and crack on with this podcast? These poor folk came here to listen to the podcast, not you two harping on. All right. Bloody hell, you can tell she's my wife, eh? Jesus. Right, may as well uh, crack on with the podcast then. So, on this week's podcast, we have Matt and Lisa interviewing Aaron on laying the draw strategy. We have Mark and Matt who are talking about trade fright. And Aaron and Mark will be talking to you on mentality and getting your head in the game to become a pro. On with the podcast. TTM is now offering one-to-one training to its 4,000 plus members, but there is a three and a half year waiting list. Sorry, Rocky. So in this next section, Lisa is going to sit down with Aaron and go over a very popular subject, which most people, well, all people will know and most people have traded, and that's lay the draw. Thank you very much, Matt. So today we are going to discuss lay the draw. So what is lay the draw, Aaron? So lay the draw is one of the most popular and probably the most simplest forms of trading. It's one where it's across the circuit. Everyone's heard about it. Most newbies will pick this up and run with it as a first strategy to try and earn some money. In essence, what we want is to place a trade saying there will not be a draw. So we want either team to win. That is it. As soon as the goal goes in, we trade out. Now, there, I know there are people out there that will say, we'll lay the draw and we will let it run and run and run. Problem with that is generally, if you let it run and run, you could lose out. We want to make money little and often. So trade out as soon as that goal comes in. So as soon as it goes green, you trade out? Yes. Yeah. Well, I say yes, but sometimes there is a risk that the underdog will score early enough that you won't actually be in green. Take it because although the red will be quite small, you can make that back no end with the amount of green you will take by the favourite scoring or whatever. So just hit that button, cash it out, trade it out and move on. So Aaron, what stats do you look out for when you're laying the draw? So for me, um, it depends what side of the game I want to trade. So I will only lay the draw for half the game be it the first half or the second half, um, depending on what stats I've got available to me and what point to go at a certain point. So, for example, if I'm looking in the second half, I want to see that there's been a large number of games where the teams have either scored or conceded in the second half. I do use the magic number from Mark, which is a fantastic little bit of information because it basically looks at how well a team attack and defend against another team's attack and defence and give us an indication that there will be goals. I also look at the relevance, so how teams compare to each other and from that I will look at the second half goal percentages. So what I do is use the TTM spreadsheets, look at second half goal for both the season and the venue. From that I want to make sure that there's a high percentage of it because that gives me a good feeling about the game. When it comes to half time though, if the game's 3 0, 4 0, even 1 0 to the favourite, then that's it. I won't trade that game for this strat because obviously it's not a draw. I will look at other strategies if the underdog's losing, but that's another chat in its entirety. So with Lay the Draw, I suppose a good way to approach it if you're looking for a game that's in play, you've got the sheets open, you could just, in in essence, apply the second half goal filters to lay the draw? Yeah, totally. Um, I personally won't have the sheet open whilst the games are in play. I will look in the morning for the whole day selection because then I know exactly what my area to look at is. That's your plan and you're not going to deviate? No, and I'm not going to just go pick a random game from, I don't know, the Kenyan Third League or, I don't know, Kazakhstani women's football teams. None of that because, A, the data is probably really poor, but it's not on the sheets and it's not been selected. So it keeps me disciplined. By just having these games, I know what I'm looking for. If at half-time they're not drawing or the favourites winning, then so be it. There's always games tomorrow. I mean, what are we? We're week nine in the Premier League this week. This is game week nine, yeah. Yeah, game week nine. So I've still got another 29 rounds to go until the season's complete. And that's in one league. 
we've got so many leagues, this is going to go on till May time. And then that's when the summer leagues start to kick in. So there's always another game coming. It, people get worked up, I need to trade every game today. I need to, no, relax, chill out. Hit the games that meet your criteria. Take the profit, no matter how small, and move on. There's an old saying, isn't there? Look after the pennies and the pounds take care of yourself. Your bank will grow massively if you just stick to what you should be doing. Absolutely. Lots of people come on Discord and go, I need to make money now. I need to make money now. No, stop. Relax. What you need to do is learn the strategies. Learn the strategies. And to do that, paper trade. Put pen to paper and go through it week after week after week. If you take half a season paper trading, you will be more confident than if you do half a season putting five, ten pound on a game and blowing four banks. So paper trading gives you that confidence. And of course, there's plenty of seasons to follow, isn't there? I don't think football's going to end anytime soon. Does them laying a draw work on all team sports? So, yes, it does. Um, I know there's people on the forum that lay the draw with cricket lay the draw with rugby, lay the draw with volleyball and some some of the other team sports that are available. Um, personally, I only stick to football, but that's because I've got a real big interest in football. I have looked at the lay the draw on some of the Rugby World Cup games that are ongoing, but unfortunately the odds are really high in general on them, so you're looking at 25 to 30. Mm, doesn't surprise me. Yeah, one loss on that. And you're wiping out a huge liability and the, actually the risk reward ratio is quite poor. Saying that, I know the cricket forum on Discord, uh, there's two or three players in there, players, sorry, people in there, that lay the draw with cricket because they will wait until the odds have come in. So the odds are quite low and then they lay it and wait for it to drift out because there's a couple of wickets or some of the big batters have hit six and then back out. So they're in there laying the draw in a very short time to get profit and get in out again. You can sit there scalping a test match all day. It becomes a full-time working week because it's five days. Yeah, it does. But it also gives you that option because it's ongoing every day as you say, Matt. You can just jump in for half an hour or so. Yeah. Get a quick scalp and get out. Well, I got involved a bit during the ashes of laying the draw and day four on two of the tests was a brilliant opportunity. Um, even on the, I think it was the first session had concluded on day five, on the fourth test, I think it was, and that presented a great opportunity. And this goes back to what we say about being able to read the markets and be disciplined, and you don't have to be in for a long time. And that's one of the reasons why I only trade half the game. So I'm not in for almost two hours and risking my money for that long. It's got to be mentioned, if you are trading day one or day two of the test match and that's you done for that test match, you won't get your winnings until the match is concluded on day four or five. No, and that that is a good point um, because what it does, it restricts your ability to then go back in on other markets with a bigger percentage. Certainly if you're compounding, you can't do that. So that is a good thing, but that's the same with football on labour draw. You can't compound till the end of the game. But to be fair, I don't. That doesn't bother me because I use my bank at the start of the day as my percentage, not yeah. keep changing it through the day. So I know what I'm putting down, regardless of whether I'm winning, losing, or uh, just doing okay. Yeah, and you like to lay the draw to the first half of a lot of games. Am I right in saying that? Yeah. So I lay the draw less in the first half. Because, let's be honest, most teams won't go full out first half because they want to see how the opposition are playing. They want to understand their tactics. But if there's a really strong favourite, you can lay draw. Um, I will generally use the half-time result market That's to what lay I the meant, draw. On it. Yeah. yeah, so it, it's really good because you can get quite low liabilities out of that. And again... It closes at half time, so I'm only in for 45 minutes. After that 45 minutes, I'll get my profit if I'm decent, and I will um, take the red if it goes against me. One thing I do like, and I do use as a indicator, 
is that either be it the half time market or the match odds market if I'm playing in second half, is still to have that favourite under decimal one point seven. Somewhere around okay. there because it because as Mark goes on a lot, we trade belief when we're trading. And I want some assurance that actually the wider population, the thinking by mass, also agree with me that there's going to be goals. Generally, the population aren't wrong. Mm -hmm. Generally. Is laying the draw higher risk than other strategies out there? Uh, So I don't believe it is, personally. I I know certainly my liabilities are a lot lower with lay the draw. If we look at... So a good a good way to compare this is laying a draw on one side and laying next goal up market on the other. Yeah. I can go Do in at half time. Ah, oh, Lisa's beat you to it. Sorry, Matt. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. No, it's an answer I want to hear. So if we look at these two markets, my max odds I ever lay at is fives because I only need to win four games to break back even again. If I'm laying a draw, generally it will be between 2.5 and 3. So for if we take 3, a £10 stake will have £20 liability. If I flip over to the plus half gold market and go in at 5s, for a £10 stake, that is £40 worth of liability. So I now need to... If I lose that game... On the Layla draw market, I'm probably going to have to win three games because I'm not I'm cashing out as soon as gold comes in. So for a ten pound stake, twenty pound liability at threes, I'm probably going to get six or seven pounds back if the favourite take the lead, which is a decent return. So let's say seven pounds. Seven times three is twenty one. I've got my twenty quid back if I've lost it. On the other market, yes, I'm going to get the full ten pound back obviously minus the commission, but I need to win four of them games to get back even if I've lost. So I do like Layla Draw because it's lower liability and it means I can get back on top rather quickly. There are pros with both. Depends how you want to look at it. I'd rather take small and often than risk losing bigger and taking more time to catch back up. Small or major balance balance grow. Not quick, but it's safer. Yeah. safer It's also... With Layla Draw, you can choose a time to get out. So I personally don't because certainly this season with new stoppage time rules, there's been a lot of late goals. I mean, I've had goals in the 96th minute, 97th minute, and I've almost got a full stake return. So I'm willing to go that far. But there may be some people that will say, right, come the 80th minute, I'm going to get out. Could that be a staking issue for some people maybe? It could be, or it could be their strategy. Um, yeah. It, it amazes me how many people on the forum go, what do you do? I want to do exactly what you do. Yeah, but if we're all doing exactly the same, the market's going to go in meltdown because it's expecting it, so all the odds will change. No one, You need to make everything your own. So if people do go out at 80 minutes, they may take, I don't know, for a £20 liability, they may take a £10 loss, so 50% red. You then win a game, you're almost back to evens. So it depends how people want to play it. Personally, I do like going to the end, certainly at the moment, and I know some people out there will be going, well, that's just better, that's just better. Yeah, exactly. Um, It's not because I do have an exit point. I have a rule and I stick to it. So even if that goal comes in the 96th minute, I will trade out. Yeah. So I won't won't get my full return. I may get eight... £8.50 but I will trade out because there's been plenty of times I've seen the other team score a minute later all of a sudden you've lost everything so it's that discipline to go goal out yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) there's only a minute left I'll wait no you will lose some granted it won't be all of them but there will be some that will hurt you I absolutely agree it's the business end of the game isn't it anything can happen yeah and I've seen many of them. Um, I've seen some where the market's not even unsuspended and the other team have scored. And that there's nothing we can do about that. You've just got to sit back, smile and move on. Because it sounds like that sounds reminiscent of the upside-down taxi crash. Uh, yeah, well, 
James was just being greedy there, in my opinion. <laughs> He's going to kill me for saying that, but no, he he was unlucky, and it does happen to a lot of people. For those who've used the simulator on the site, there's many games where you're going through, you're going using the five minute button to skip on, skip, skip. Oh, there's two goals. Where did they come from? It does yep. happen regularly, <laughs> so it it's not once in a blue moon. It can happen two or three times. And there's some people who lay the under 1.5 strategy that absolutely love when that happens because they get a full payout instead of just taking that little bit of green. Yeah. So that is there any more questions from you at all? No, obviously lay the draw. It's great to hear about, as I said at the start of the segment, it's a strategy that everybody knows. And I'm sure everybody's got a way they play it or an idea of how to play it. So I'm hoping that what Aaron's just explained there is certainly going to help people, if they are looking to use it, to kick on and apply their own parameters to it. Hopefully it's given them some food for thought of maybe tweaking their exit and entry points. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you for joining us, Aaron, on telling us all about Lay the Draw. Lots of insightful information there for us, especially for an office like myself. <laughs> so thank you. I'm not letting you loose with my bank account on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks all. You chose way back and trade, probably because you thought BTC stood for the Banana Tossing Championship. So, in this segment, we're going to be speaking to somebody I haven't spoken to for a couple of weeks. We're going to be discussing a topic I'm aware of, but I don't know a great deal about, so hopefully we're all going to enjoy this one. We're going to discuss Trade Fright with Mark. Mark, welcome. How are you doing? I'm good, thank you, Matt, and thanks for uh, having me back on onto your uh, podcast. Well, ultimately, it's your community, so what Len says goes. <laughs> uh, you're making me sound like a dictatorship there. Well, um, it feels like China, doesn't it? It is, a little bit, yeah, a little bit. Uh, I'm not going to lie. Uh, remember, you, you need to get all the jokes I met this time because I, I did have a comment saying you didn't understand quite a lot of the jokes. Well, it's the North South divide, isn't it? Yeah, I, I was just going to go with educated and uneducated. The dialect. Obviously, you being the learned, you being the learned man. Well, people would assume that I'm the more educated because I suppose I'm the better spoken. I like how you say better spoken as well. I <laughs> I realised when I said that, I thought <laughs> you prick, you really put it on there. <laughs> no, I like it. Let's get into uh, Trade Fright. So Trade Fright, I will say, is... And I'm probably going to get told I'm wrong, but um, I feel like... I don't feel like it is. It's something that I've coined, and I believe I've coined, unless somebody tells me I can prove it game otherwise, uh, from somewhere else otherwise. It's definitely something I coined. And Trade Fright is basically the fear of trading. So the fear that you're going to lose your bank or lose money by trading. And it's something that I think a lot of people whether they know it or they don't know it, uh, do suffer from. Uh, is it something you've suffered from, Matt? Probably not. It, at times when I first started out, I mean, I don't trade a huge amount at the moment, but there are probably times actually where I could have done with trade fight when I first started, because when you first start, it lights up and you start treating the exchange like a bookmaker. So actually there were times where you should have opened it up and actually sat back, but that, that all comes with making the crossover. Yeah, 100%. What, what I will say is one of the biggest things for trade fright is it's for somebody who's lost money so if you've lost a substantial amount of money you you tend to suffer with stage fright uh stage fright uh trade fright uh you can see where i ripped it off from can't you for someone who's lost a lot of money they will suffer from the fear of trading because they don't want to lose that money again i can give like a few examples of where you'll get trade fright and it won't you won't realize that you've had it or you you are suffering with it and that's for rounded numbers in your account. So if you've started off with a bank and you've built your bank from 50 quid to 500 pound, once you get to that 500 pound and that was your goal milestone, you'll be scared to trade because you'll be scared to drop under that again because it feels like you've lost an achievement. And that's the bit that becomes scary. Okay. So it, it's rounded numbers are very important. So say you got your bank to a thousand pound, and you're like, "Yes, I've managed to break that four figure. That that was my goal was to get it to that four thousand pound mark. Oh, sorry, that thousand pound mark, that four figure. Um, it's then that fear of it dropping back into three digits again. Interesting. So you could look at both sides of trade fright or the opposite of trade fright, where people may even overstake or understake their percentages which they've set as part of maybe the compounding process where they think, oh, sod it, I'll just, I'll round it up to this figure or that figure because it will leave 
a round number or the state could be a round number. Do you, do you see where I'm coming from there? Yeah, of course I see where you're coming from. And it's that rounded number that it could be an enemy to traders and um, to anybody trying to sort of establish a bank or uh, trying to grow in confidence. Now, what I will say is if you do have a fear of putting a trade on or you fear you're losing money, in my opinion, it's generally because you haven't got, you can't afford to lose that money. You, you may be overstaking um, on the exchange. You may be risking too much. And the only way to get over that trade fright is literally by either reducing your trades, uh, sorry, you, you're staking your trades um, because you, you, you're staking too much or removing that whole number fear. So if you get to a thousand, pat yourself on the back, take 500 out, carry on for 500 up and see if you can get to a thousand again. Mm, very good. Good info. And obviously it's a, coin, a phrase you believe you've coined. Are you, have you had people in the community come to you with trade fright? I'm not asking you to name them, but how have those conversations gone, if you, if you don't mind telling us? Yeah, yeah, 100%. Uh, I've had many people come to me, and they, they, they'll call it a fear of trading or the, the fear of you know, risking money. And the, the, the conversation goes with... Conversation is just rationalising it. It's just rationalising the thought that the, what they did to get to that stage they can do again and repeat and when people have lots of money in their account it can be uh, a bit daunting so i currently work on 500 pound a point so for every uh, point i use up to five points which would be my five percent is 500 pound i can put uh, two and a half grand onto a horse and i have no fear not because i am ultra confident or i never lost anything or it's a sure thing none of them things the reason i'm confident and I, I have no fear, so should I say, is because I've stayed within my limits and within my risk and my risk reward scenario. Sort of be having that discipline and that mentality around your staking and around trading and understanding it's a business and you have to you have to put money into it and risk money in order to make money. Um, it, it's just like at the foremost of what you should be doing. It's yeah. So if you if you are in constant fear when you put a trade on that you're going to lose that money it's because that money is too big for your bank or too big for your discipline currently um your mindset's not ready to lose and it may only be like a 10 and you may think oh it's only a 10 pound um but wait if you put it on and you're getting that palpitation from it oh that i could lose this then that 10 pound is too high for you and what i recommend and what i have recommended in these conversations to people is that you start on a smaller amount and just work your way up until you start getting comfortable with it. Mm-hmm. But th- there are people who, who come to me with trade fright that um, have never never traded again as well, sadly. So, two sides. Yeah. Well, a lot of what you're saying here, certainly towards the end of the segment, is going to tie in very nicely with another section we've got coming up very soon. So, on the on this same episode. So, that, that's all really interesting. Um, before we do move on to the next section, have you got anything further you would advise regarding trade fright how to either deal with it or how to avoid it to deal with it i would i would rationalize it so we have the discord the community um i would genuinely just rationalize it if you've got if you get on with somebody in there or you know somebody um in the in sort of your own communities in real life that um you can speak to uh, that also trades and can rationalize it if i if you came to me matt and said I have trade fright because I'm wagering. I don't want to go under this amount. Then I don't want to go under my thousand pound in my bank. Then I can help you rationalize that, and, and I can res- help you rationalize it with by removing the figure. So remove the thousand pound um, and reduce the figure. Trade fright comes from irrational behaviour. In that situation, you just need somebody to be rational for you, uh, or to you, should I say? And that person, uh, ration, uh, ra- that person's rationale will help you understand that ultimately you just, it's your brain going, you shouldn't do this when you actually, you should be doing it. Because to get to that bank in the first place, you were doing something right. No, absolutely. Great, great bits of advice there, mate. Thank you very much. No worries. You're welcome. I'm Joe Biden, and the only podcast I listen to is Lay Back and Trade by Trading the Market.
so in the next section we are going to discuss treating trading like a business. So Mark, what sort of technology platforms do you need to treat trading like a business? Uh, very good question. What's my answer, Aaron? <laughs> <laughs> Did you get oh, we need to keep that in there. <laughs> It is a first. Yeah. That, that will stay in there. What is my answer? <laughs> so I'm going to pull Mark out of a hole now. Um, Thank you. you. You don't need any technology really to treat trading like business. However, technology can help you. So there's all sorts of separate technologies out there. Um, software, AI, all of that out there that can help you treat this like business but you don't need anything sophisticated all you need to be able to do is come up with a strategy which you can do yourself record your trades excel use some form of stats software to understand what you're looking for spreadsheets there's loads of databases out there there's plenty of websites where you can get stats from and the biggest technology you need some say text some say website is betfair or another exchange, I only say Betfair because it's got the most money running through it out of all of them. I mean, Mark, you don't use anything other than your computer, do you? No, so I, I won't trade on the. I won't trade on my phone. Um, I only use my computer, and I only trade when I'm at my computer in the office. So I have several computers in the house, um, but I only trade when I'm sat in the office because, for me, trading. As we were talking about technology, but what I will say is, for me, trading is my business. And I go to work, and when I go to work, that's me going to trading. And I do that in the office, so I don't use uh, any other devices. So there's no phone, there's no tablet sat in the lounge or anything like that. It's literally just me sat at a desk, uh, like I would be if I was turning up for a job. And uh, I use that to trade. That's great. It, it's, brought, it's brought something to my mind there, because... Um, obviously I know now you've said and you've said before that is what you do that's your work you trade at your desk Aaron what what about you what's your kind of setup when you traditionally trade so I try and sit at my desk as much as I can but I'm not going to lie on anything there's occasions where I can't do that for one reason or another um, so I use examples of being at the families, at the in-laws or wherever, and I haven't got my computer desk there, my setup with me. But it's very quiet, there's nothing going on. Family sat down watching TV, uh, falling asleep after a huge roast dinner, and I've got a chance then just to sit down with my laptop, I'll put my big headphones on, noise cancelling, and I can do a little bit there. Mm. If I haven't got my laptop with me, I can use the iPad, but it's not preferable because well apple just lock everything down so it makes trading so much harder but generally i will try and sit at my desk because it it focuses you if you're sat in front of the tv on the phone you're watching the tv you're not concentrating on what you're doing and that's where your losses will occur so i like mark i do like to be sat down in front of a computer Mm, i agree it gets it's a focus isn't it but before I progress to the next question I was going to ask you, Aaron, do any of your colleagues listen to this? I don't know. <laughs> Let's <laughs> assume they not. don't. Let's assume they don't. Singapore games kick off typically about quarter to 12. First half goals, they often appear on there. If they get to the odds, would you place that on your phone, for example, at work? And I'm not digging here because this is what I do. So Because uh, I believe uh, that Singapore games, for example, are good opportunities if they reach the odds. Yeah, unfortunately, with my job... I can be called away from a desk at at a moment's notice. Um, Previously, I was in a different job where actually I didn't do much. (laughs) So I had a bit more time to be able to do things in work. But now I'm in a new job which is actually really busy, really dynamic. So I I will have them programmed in on my phone, but that's merely so that when I come to record all my trades in my diary at the end of the day, I've got the answers in front of me. I haven't got to go digging for them. But I won't do it in work anymore because, say I'm laying a draw. We've talked about that this evening already. I lay the draw. I get called away from my desk for 50, 60 minutes. 
I come back and it's drawn. I've I've lost that when I could have been out after a goal, so I won't do it in work. It sounds like there's been a bit of a role reversal there because at the start of this week I managed a back test using the simulator about 300 games in one day on the over 3.5. I, I bet your bosses don't know anything about that until today. He's in Italy. <laughs> <laughs> My advice for anybody who's currently in a job, uh, by the way, is make sure you're the last person in the building and the first person out of it. Uh, there's no point trying to make somebody else richer when you should be concentrating on yourself. So I think fair play to you, Matt. That sounds like the sign I saw in Nando's. Make up, what was that? Make up for turning up late by leaving early. I actually like that, to be fair, yeah. I like that, I like that a lot. So, a question for both Aaron and Mark. I'm sure you've got your own take on it. Um, so, for say it's my first day getting stuck into the exchange. I want to take it seriously, whether somebody was a pedestrian gambler or not beforehand. What are your steps in order to take it seriously, to treat it like a business? What I'll say is, in order to treat it like a business, you have to treat it, treat it like a business. So, like, you, you should have time away from your normal um, surroundings. So, if you, you normally sat somewhere, say, on the settee with your laptop, try sitting at a kitchen table. Try just putting yourself into a different environment. In in order for you to, uh, to take it with the seriousness that, you, seriousness that you need to, you need to change stuff about what you regularly do in order to make it make it like you're turning up for a job um i will say as well is that just like if you went to go and start a new job um uh, whatever it may be technical or not uh, you wouldn't start without an induction you wouldn't start with without training and you wouldn't be off on your own until you're competent at what you were doing and that should be the same when you're starting out if you if you're coming new to trading then you should have that introduction, so that's your basic learning. You should have your training, that's you learning and paper trading. And then you shouldn't be going full force without first learning everything you need to do uh, in order to be safe, compliant and not blow your bank. Uh, that would probably be the best advice i give to somebody starting out yourself, Aaron. So for me, I'm going to come at this from quite a technical standpoint. So... I like I like the idea of the CAD mid cycle. So for those who don't know what CAD mid is, it's sort of a through life uh, product development plan. So if you want to really treat it like business, on day one you need to come up with the concept of what you want to do. So if you want to lay the draw, that's your concept. If you want a back uh, over two point five goals, that's your concept. You then need to sit down and assess that concept by back testing and understanding what the results can be and what it can bring. You then develop that into your own personal strategy. It's something that gives you the edge. And then the next stage in CADMID is manufacture, but we're not going to manufacture, we're going to put it into practice and go through that in-service phase of routinely doing the same thing over and over and over. But that's far down line. On day one, you need to just sit down, come up with a concept and start back testing, start analysing things around you. Don't put any money into the market yet, none at all. Uh, paper trade, use the simulator, get confident in what you are doing. And Mark, to add nicely to that, what Aaron's saying, from designing your concept, you're a fan actually of not typing it up on a computer, but physically writing it in a book, aren't you? Oh yeah, 100%. I think... We, we type and we use computers so frequently uh, in our day-to-day -day lives or work or what have you that uh, words typed, uh, I think it's quite easy to, to write stuff down on a computer or send emails or, or so on and so forth. But when you actually have a notebook, a physical notebook in your hand and you go through that pain of cramp as you're making, furiously making notes or writing it down and trying, trying to keep it as neat as possible, there's just there's just more there's more of a seriousness to it there's more of a i'm putting this down in paper is symbolic it, it's saying this means something because i'm taking the time to put pen to paper so yeah massive fan of writing stuff down um actually with a pen and paper only because uh, psychologically it, it adds more importance to your subconscious to the things you have written down so yeah great 
a great tool for anybody who's starting out or learning and i think if you want to learn something i think writing it down in full like you're trying to explain it to your gran uh, that will help you massively learn it yourself I, i'm a, also a big believer that if you can't if you can't explain something to your own grandma that she could understand then you probably don't understand it yourself it's all right for me i've got lisa to explain it all to <laughs> i'll give up thanks both my grandmothers are dead <laughs> leave that in. Leave that, that in. Brought, that, <laughs> it down a notch. <laughs> that brought it. Yeah, that brought it down a little bit. <laughs> sorry, yeah, sorry for your loss there, Matt. Yeah, sorry, know. sorry for your losses. Yeah. Oh, mine are dead too. We've just brought the conversation down there, haven't we? Yeah. Nah, it's fine. Well, this segment of this feature was it was to talk about getting into the mindset or or how we treat this like a business and. At the end of the day, if you want to earn money from it and you want it to be a full-time income for you, then you have to treat it like a business because you can't, although you, some of us probably can, you can't turn up for work, toss it off all day and expect to get a nice big salary at the end of it. Uh, them jobs are few and far between and the, the people that do it outside of them jobs are, are not often in them all that long. So we do have to treat it like a business. It is a job and anybody who says it isn't, Again, I don't see them lasting very long. I hope you would agree with me there, Aaron. Yeah, I would. Um, it's For a lot of people, it's getting that concept into their which they struggle with. A lot of them want to do this full-time. They want to trade full-time, but they don't understand that most businesses actually start part-time, start with an hour here, hour there, and then develop onwards. So it's quite important to get like business, they don't want to throw money away. It's all about profit. And they need to get to that same stage where they're constantly making profit, but being sensible about it and not chasing, chasing, chasing. That statement right there is fucking brilliant. So putting pen to paper is a safe option to get yourself practicing, get yourself to understand it, get the logic and get the tools you need to earn that bank and start earning it and start treating it like a business. Yeah, you're not... By putting pen to paper, paper trading as we call it, and as Mark's described, writing down all your criteria and your rules, you're not risking money, but you can see whether what you're doing is going to work. And there are tools out there, like we said, the simulator and all that, which you can use to help backtest. Um, a lot of people on the Discord use CGM bet to help back test and all of that. So there are options out there. It's just whether you're dedicated enough to be able to do that. Definitely, it does sound like you need to be dedicated. And you got. Do you think you need to treat it as a full time business, or can you do it as a part time? Mark's obviously got a different view because he does do this full time. Yeah. For me, it depends what you want to get out of it. If you want just two or three hundred extra pounds a month, then you can do it part time. If you want to go full time, then you need to get in that mindset. But regardless of whether it's full time, part time, one day a week, three days a week, you've got to treat it like business where you don't want unnecessary losses. Mark, what's your view? Uh, yeah, I'd agree. So when I started out, this started out for me part time, so I'd spend the time I had outside of work. Um, learning and uh, setting up my sort of development and then as I got better and better and better uh, that became a full-time role and I left working um, as my main income and trading as my main income but as I've grown and got better and better and better still uh, it's become a part-time thing again because I earn the money I wish to earn from trading in less than part-time hours so I think there's a full circle sort of to it and people, if you were starting as a new startup, uh, as a business, you would have to pump hours and hours and hours into that to get that off the ground and it's going to be hard and that's why most people give up in the end uh, or through circumstance or mentality but you have to be willing to put that in because that is like your foundation and without that foundation you can't build anything and if you can't if you do build anything it's only going to collapse so i went part-time as i was learning the basics full-time trying to make a full-time out of it and um taking that leap 
back into part time. So I, I probably spend in since the last podcast, I've probably spent maybe I'd like to say three hours trading in them two weeks. But um, I'm quite happy with the the return I've had off that. But that that comes from, and I, I say this a lot. I say it a lot in the Discord. It's a ten, the ten thousand hours mentality, isn't it? It's it's in order to be great at something, you have to put in the time and the effort and the dedication. Um, if you want to be, if you wanted to be the best footballer you play in the Premier League, you'd have to put hours and hours and hours into training, development, nutrition, uh, mentality. It's exactly the same for traders. If you want it, this to be a business and you want to treat it like a business, you have to give it the respect that you would do if you went to go and be uh, a footballer, a politician, whatever job you can think or think of doing. You have to put that time in. I'd be interested to see as well how off, uh, how many hours a, a doctor with a six-year degree puts in as well, um, because I, I think it probably roughly to similar to the ten thousand hours. Would I be right? If you think about airline pilots, they have to have, I think it's a thousand hours in a small aircraft and a thousand hours in the next one. And by the time they get to becoming that commercial airline pilot, they're probably about five, six thousand hours flying. So I, I know I won't get in an aircraft with a pilot who's only flown 10 hours. I'd be crapping myself. <laughs> but yeah, it. I, I can't think of many professional jobs where people just turn up and do it. I, I, I just give it a bit of perspective. I'm just doing a bit of quick maths. Um, if you spent 35 hours a week, every single week for six years, you would then reach your 10,000 hours. And that's what they say is you need 10,000 hours to be an expert. No, it's all very good to listen to. And actually, I will admit, I made notes just then to go back and listen to during this segment so I can add them to my word document for my november plan get a pen and paper i've told you i started on the pen and paper but i'll move it to there as well i've also got a hard copy which i'll print out which i have done already actually but yeah pen and paper way forward matt you haven't seen my writing i'm left-handed ah right okay yeah you stick with typing mate i have to to clean the uh the knuckle of my little finger after a heavy writing session there is nothing wrong with lefties. All you have to do is tilt the paper at a degree and hey-ho, there'll be no writing or smudges. It's my own style it's of shorthand. What, spider? I sometimes don't even understand what I've written. <laughs> I'm not allowed to write the shopping list at home either. Really? Nope. Nope. <laughs> I see, I, I've, I've got a... Uh, Mine's a gift and a curse, really, because I've got incredibly nice writing but can't spell anything. I thought you were going to say you have your own personal shopper. No, no, no. <laughs> my my gift is like uh, being able to paint perfect pictures but not having any vision to see. I'm surprised you don't do, um, what is it, pick up your phone and go, speaker, I want to order bananas, and then it adds to your shopping for you. No, I, I, I genuinely have... So I have a, a Samsung S23 Ultra. So I have a stylus in, in built into the phone that I just clips out. And I use it so often. People are like, oh, it's just a gimmick. You don't need it. I use it so often to make notes because uh, I prefer handwriting stuff. But if anybody was to read it, like the handwriting, it, it almost looks like calligraphy. But um, it, yeah, there's just missing letters or extra letters. Yeah, I've been working on spelling my own name correctly. I've, I'm, I'm almost there. Is it the two ends you can't quite join up together? Uh, it's not. Even, no, it's not even that. It's the when I spell the when I spell my first name Mark. I'm trying to get it down, but currently I'm using three X's. But apparently, there's no X's in this at all. Now I don't expect to get that joke because uh, well, I assume it was you, you a few in the last writing one. notes to yourself on the fridge and putting kisses at the end of it. <laughs> well, just putting kisses to myself. <laughs> here's here's an insight into my life that um, not many people know, but I have quite a large white fridge, and I ha- on top of it I have a set of whiteboard pens, 
and when I have an idea as I'm cooking or washing up or I'm in the, around the kitchen area, um, I will start thrashing out formulas or ideas onto the front of the fridge. That's staying in, isn't it? What are you like? That is staying in, yeah. <laughs> I use the fridge as a whiteboard. This part won't. If I ever come to your house, I am drawing massive cock and balls on the front of it. Not a chance. <laughs> Um, which, which part coming to your house or doing that both <laughs> I, hey, what, I thought I'd be what, invited though what do you say sorry Lisa I thought I'd be invited um, it depends on the cock and ball situation really but uh, I'll leave him at home <laughs> <laughs> the I, I use I, I'm not going to uh, I'm not going to let you draw on it it's currently got some some quite interesting formulas on it that I'm working on currently so uh, and that was from yesterday cooking uh, a steak. I was I was thinking as uh, as I was uh, as I was cooking and chopping and what have you, and then I had to take the uh, pan off the hob and uh, start thrashing it out. The formula. <laughs> well, thanks for uh, thanks for listening to Drone On, and uh, I'll leave you guys uh, for the next feature. Thank you very much. Definitely. Thank you for joining us today. No worries. Thank you very much. Cheers, Aaron. Cheers, Lisa. Cheers, Matt. I'm Donald Trump, and the only podcast I listen to is laid back and trade by trading the market. James, this is the outro of the podcast, as you don't get involved in too many of them because of your busy schedule. Uh, This is where we have to pretend like we've just listened to it and we didn't record this three and a half minutes after we just recorded the intro. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Is that actually going in? <laughs> yeah. Oh, for God's sake. Yeah, Mark, yeah, we most definitely didn't record this back-to-back just before listening to the podcast. Uh, I would say it was a very interesting podcast. It was an amazing podcast, Mark. I, I really enjoyed the bit where that person said that thing. Yeah, me too, Mark. I really enjoyed the bit in space. <laughs> that's a niche reference James I'm not sure everybody will get that but uh, <laughs> I like it <laughs> really enjoyed it we, we genuinely we have listened to the podcast because this recorded on the morning of the release of the podcast as you can tell uh, as we, we spoke and referenced uh, the death of, sad death of Sir Bobby Charlton so we have listened to it because by this point we've we've edited it together yeah, yeah. James as we we just finished talking about, or they've just finished talking about treating trading as a business and the mentality behind that. Have you anything to add on it? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ideal. And this is why James is not normally on the podcast, as uh, as most answers are limited to single words, yeah. usually five letters or less. Very Isn't that right, James? Very short and sweet, to be fair. I like to be to the point. Um, I'm not a big fan of being on podcasts come on from time to time don't get me wrong you know what I mean I'm on I'm on with you now not really my thing I uh, I actually enjoy uh, listening to the podcast more than being on it and yeah and if I was on the podcast I wouldn't get the experience of um, hearing it like you guys at home it's like Oasis so will never know what it's like to go to a, an Oasis gig if you like I couldn't agree with you more though James but yeah I will pop on from time to time and I always um, I always enjoy having a little chat with you Mac I know you do yeah <laughs> I enjoy talking to me too. <laughs> Shut up! Uh, James, that's the end of the podcast. Um, um, yeah, I believe so. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks for listening. Uh, episode six will be out in two weeks. Um, Can't wait. Bye. Um, yeah, bye. Until next time. I'll be ready. Bye. 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 Why are people still listening? <laughs> Literally, the podcast finished. Why are people still here? <laughs> Waiting for an encore. Oh, I, I, I'm glad we finished recording because I wanted to tell you about that super secret strategy that, that I've got 100 percent strike rate on. Oh yeah. So what I've been what I've been doing is, you know, in the first half, and you click on to the first half goal market. If the price is at 